Welcome to the Mercy Tobiotic Research Institute's February Sitback Seminar. My name is Chad Simmons. I'm the communication officer here at MTRI. And um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting here today in Guestwick, one of the seven districts of Mi'kma'ki, homeland to the Mi'kmaq people. And I'd like to acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship and thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. And for anyone who's not aware, uh, the Mercy Tobiotic Research Institute is a research-based nonprofit nestled in southwest Nova Scotia near Kejimakujik National Park and Historic Site. And our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Guestwick as well as beyond. So today I'm very pleased to introduce Hillary Mann. Hillary just successfully defended her Master's of Science thesis, and she's now continuing her work on various bird research projects throughout Atlantic Canada. So I'm going to hand it over to her shortly. But before that, I'd like to remind everyone to please keep their mute, um, mics muted. And if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type them into the chat bar or wait until the end. We'll, we're going to have a question period. So, Hillary? Great. Thanks a lot, Chad. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's really wonderful here. I'm just going to make sure. Are you able to see that? Okay, yeah, so it's really great to have everyone here. And I guess one benefit of this being um, virtual is that I know that there's a number of people here from Ontario and BC and elsewhere. So that's really, really great. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this today because I've been talking for the last three years a lot about kind of very research heavy side of barn swallows, but I think that there's a lot of really interesting stories and uh, kind of really interesting tidbits about them that I have found over the years that I'm really excited to share. Um, so there will be a couple points that where you can um, where there can be discussion, if you would like, throughout the presentation, which we can judge as we're going whether or not we just want to save some questions for the end. So I want to start off by just asking this question. When was the last day that you did not see or hear a bird? Now, you can feel free to type your answer in the chat box or if you want to unmute yourself and say a quick yes or no. I think that this might be a really hard question for a lot of us to answer. I can't actually see the chat box when I'm doing this. I can let you know if someone says <laughs> right? it. But so I think that this is really hard because birds are so pervasive in our lives. They are found in nearly every habitat. Um, and they also look really neat a lot of the times and catch your eye. But it doesn't need to be a bird as interesting as the ones that are here. It could be something as common as like a pigeon or, or a crow or a gull. The chances are you can't really remember the last time. Some people are being a little cheeky and saying today. And Adam Ward says maybe on a cold day in February. This is also something that I was wondering because I don't know if I just surround myself with people who have gotten used to me pointing out every single bird that I see throughout the day. And so now they also see them, but that's really interesting. But no matter what the answer is, birds are everywhere. And even in the dead of winter, you can you don't need to go far to be able to see a gull fly over the road or see a, see a crow kind of in a, a dumpster or something. <laughs> um, and so given that, birds are so abundant, they're so visible, and that people generally enjoy watching them. They are really excellent animals to use as targets for citizen or community science initiatives. And so bird watching is incredibly widespread around the world. And that means that there's this really immense network of experts that can be tapped into to help us understand what is happening with the birds around us. And because the birds rely on the plants, insects, and other animals in the ecosystem, we also live in. This can help us treat, keep track of the health of our ecosystems and our impact on the world we live in. 
So this is really well displayed if we look at some of the very successful community science projects that involve birds. And so one of these is this project Fido Lodge, which is a joint project with Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Birds Canada. This is a really successful project that now I believe it's in its 34th year and upwards of uh, 20,000 people in Canada and the US participate every year. You put in data on the number of birds and the type of birds that you see at your bird feeders throughout the winter. And this really helps answer a lot of questions about winter distribution and abundance. And with this data, we can answer a lot of really important questions like looking at long-term trends in bird distribution and abundance. We can see if birds have shifted their range over time and where those shifts have happened. You can look at what kind of foods and environmental factors attract birds and a, a lot of other really useful questions. But if you think about it, not all animals will be equally as accessible or easy to observe and study. Those that are found in more places that are less shy and generally live closer to humans will be seen by a lot more people and will have kind of more eyes to watch them and monitor them over time. And so one of the birds that best fits this criteria is the barn swallow. So the, that's the bird pictured here. Um, we see these here from about April to September and otherwise they're found in South America where they spend our winters. I believe that the Mi'kmaq word for them is pugualis, but I am not sure if that refers to swallows in general or tree swallows. Um, if anyone knows, I'm happy to learn. So the barn swallow is a small bird. It is only about the length of your hand and the weight of a big strawberry, but somehow they're able to make that really long flight down to South America. So barn swallows are actually quite appropriately named. At one point, they would have made their nest kind of in cliff faces or in caves. But over time, they transitioned to using more structures built by uh, Indigenous people. And then more recently, they are almost exclusively nest in human-made structures like barns or sheds like are pictured here. They really like having a sheltered area that they can find inside these uh, buildings. And they also really look for kind of constant access. So an uh, open window or open door is really necessary for them to be able to get in and out through the breeding season. Barn swallows are extremely widespread throughout the world. So here you can see that in the orange, this is where barn swallows are typically found when they breed in our summer period. Um, and in blue, those are all the places where they typically head south to spend our winters um, to escape the cold and kind of the lack of insects that we have here because they do eat insects. <laughs> um, and so part of, is they are so abundant and so widespread that they haven't actually been listed as threatened or endangered at all internationally, but it's a different story when you look at Canada in particular and the uh, North America as a whole. So barn swallows in Canada are listed as threatened under the Species at Risk Act, which does come with some protections. Um, but it also does indicate that their populations have kind of substantially declined, even though they are still a somewhat common bird. So we can see that if we look here, these are results from the Breeding Bird Atlas, which is essentially a um, survey that has happened twice in the Maritimes, uh, where you can see that the darker color represents um, the higher likelihood that you would see a barn swallow. So back during the first atlas in 1986 to 1990, they were quite abundant. You were very likely to see them uh, kind of throughout all of the Maritimes. But if you look at the more recent atlas on the right done between 2006 to 2010, you really, uh, there aren't a lot of places anymore where you will likely see barn swallows. And even in those places where you're most likely, you're less likely to see them than you were kind of 20 years ago. So this corresponds with other information that we have gotten from, for example, breeding bird surveys. Um, 
which say that since 1970, barn swallow populations in Nova Scotia have declined by greater than 90%. So that's a really dramatic decline. And it also corresponds with stories that you hear from um, in people who have kind of grown up on farms and seen these changes over time. So a lot of the farmers at farms that I visit talk about when they were a kid, how uh, the barn swallows would line the power lines between like three or four or five power poles, but now they don't see anything close to that, those numbers. Um, and so with these declines, and the, the barn swallows are really acting as kind of a canary in a coal mine. Uh, they are reliant on the insects that pollinate our food and are the base of many other food webs. And they are, are also affected by environmental changes like climate change that threaten both people and other species. And so because of that, it's really important to look at kind of why they declined. So they do, their primary prey are flying insects. And so it makes sense that there, there have been widespread insect declines um, that have likely played a role in their barn swallow declines as well. We also see that pesticides have likely played a role in their decline where increased pesticide use both decreases the number of insects available, but also could have harmful effects on the swallows themselves in terms of their toxicity. Habitat loss has also been a major contributor to their declines. Um, this is a photo taken from the Tantramar region, so the kind of border area between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And I forget what year this was taken in, um, but you can see all these kind of marsh barns dotted across the landscape. These were once home to a large number of barn swallows, but now I think that the last count they were maybe three or four of those barns left standing down from hundreds. And so it's things like this that we see where there's a loss in the kind of breeding structures that are available. But on a more broad scale, there's been a loss of their kind of the wetland habitats that they use during their migration, um, as well as that they rely on for plentiful insects during the breeding season. Um, and so, we do see that habitat loss plays a big role. And lastly, climate change has uh, played a role in the declines as well. Um, it's increased the number of uh, kind of intense extreme weather events, whether it be intense cold snaps or um, intense heat waves that they experience. And this has uh, played a role in their declines and is expected to play a much stronger role in the future as it worsens. And so at this point, you might be asking, how do you know so much about swallows? And that's not uh, like me personally, but in general, people. And so this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with the swallows um, being kind of really closely intertwined with people. So whether or not you know it, barn swallows have like are, are quite an important part of our kind of cultural fabric going back for a very long time. Um, in current time, so this is a utility box on a random street in Portugal that has been painted with designs of barn swallows. Um, and then also pretty much, well, not all, but a large portion of the kind of shirts that you'll see with generic bird shapes or tattoos or just like bird related paraphernalia. A lot of times those will be barn swallows on the shirt with their distinctive forked tails. And so it's not just now that we see a lot of these um, kind of bird themes in the kind of cultural artifacts of our time. If we can look at the scent bottle that was found in what is kind of current day Turkey around 600 BC. So this is a very long time ago and it's clearly a barn swallow with its kind of reddish uh, neck and its forked tail. So even looking way back, we see that um, these barn swallows have played in their symbology and kind of their artwork have played an important role. And this is reflected in a lot of, kind of stories, myths and legends over time. I'm curious if anyone has, is familiar with any kind of stories or 
um, omens. If there, if anyone has any fables of um, Barnes follows that they know, I'll give you a minute. I'll also take a drink. Well, if anyone has a idea, you can just put it in the chat. Um, so there are kind of endless stories, myths, and legends that you can find. So for Indigenous groups in the U.S., um, some groups tell a story of how barn swallows got their fork in their tail, where it went to steal fire from the sun, and then uh, God got angry and hurled a fire arrow at it, singed the middle tail feathers, and that's how it, how it got its forked tail. You also see from like ancient Greece, Aesop's fables, you get the um, proverb, one swallow doesn't make a summer. And it goes on and on, especially in terms of um, the arrival of springtime. In one area in Germany, they used to have a watchman on a tower who every spring would to keep an eye out for the first swallow of the spring. And when it was seen, the magistrate would announce it to everyone in the town as a sign of spring to come. You also see a lot about the swallows being either good or bad omens. For example, in Greece, if a swallow was found inside a house, it needed to be caught, smeared with oil, and then released to ward off bad luck. But also if you they nested in the outbuildings, it was generally thought to be lucky and protective against disaster. Um, and in another example in Norfolk in the UK, a gathering of swallows on a roof foretold death of someone in the house. So not there's many, many more. And if you are interested, these two uh, resources that I've listed have some really interesting stories. Um, yeah, the, the, that's a good source to see more. So not only do these stories tell us about how barn swallows have been a part of kind of human life for a very long time, but they also convey some fundamental knowledge about barn swallow biology, like their arrival in spring after their migration. And you can actually look at kind of stories um, and see how knowledge changes over time, especially with new um, kind of research. Um, so it was a long held belief that when birds left for the winter time that they were hibernating. So for a long time, it was thought that they would burrow underground or go into a like, tree cavity and rest. But you see that kind of change over time. So in 1555, this man, Olaus Magnus, um, it brought up the idea of underwater hibernation where the swallows would actually go deep into the sea. And this image here is of fishermen using a net to get the uh, barn swallows out from under the icy water. From there, we can see there is this book called The Man in the Moon, which was actually a, kind of a science fiction novel from 1638. And it's the story of a man who um, on his kind of journey around the world finds a group of swallows and other birds that are flying to the moon for their, um, for their migration. And so he uses, the, he kind of straps them up and uses them to fly him to the moon. So it seems like that might have been the basis for this idea by a man, Charles Morton, about 30 years later, who wrote kind of this essay on bird migration and did actually suggest that during springtime or for migration, the birds would fly all the way to the moon. Thought that it would take about two months to get there, which now, because we know how far the moon is away, would mean that the swallows were flying for... Uh, two months straight at about 125 miles per hour, which swallows are pretty fast, but they aren't that fast. So that was a, the, not so much the moon idea, but these, all these ideas kind of stuck around for a while until really the 1900s when we started to be able to use bird banding to answer some more specific questions about um, migration. And so this isn't a barn swallow here. Um, 
but you can see on its leg, it has this little metal band. And on that, there's a unique identifier. Um, and so what happens is, in the example of the barn swallow, um, they put the band on somewhere in Europe and then recovered it months later at a different location in Africa. So then they were able to use that to understand that. Yes, in fact, the birds do fly from um, all the way from Europe down to Africa. So bird banding is a really integral, it's been a longstanding strategy used to answer a lot of different questions. But now we can get even more sophisticated with kind of the technology and the methods that we use to um, find more specific knowledge. So for example, there was this paper written by Tara Imlay, who was a PhD student who uh, did a lot of work on barn swallows in the Maritimes where she looked at kind of compounds and I believe the feathers of barn swallows that were breeding in the Maritimes and looked at where those feathers would have been grown, which indicates where they spend their winter. And so if you look at these maps here, you have two different years represented that show kind of the most likely areas that the barn swallows actually spent their winter. And those are indicated by the darker colors. And so now using like uh, methods like this, you can get really detailed information where you can actually see like how they shift over time and where they're more, most likely to spend their winter. And you can use this to uh, answer really important questions concerning like the conservation of the species. Because if they're facing kind of limiting factors on their non-breeding grounds where they spend their time down in South America, then you can know that you need to, you, you know where you need to target these actions um, to kind of help their populations recover. And so this example of a, uh, some research fits in really well with kind of where the general direction with kind of current research questions on barn swallows and particularly in the conservation of barn swallows has been going. So the main questions that are being asked now is how are their populations doing? Why have they declined? And what can we do to help their recovery? And so the last question is really what my research was interested in addressing, where I was essentially asking what makes a good barn swallow breeding site? And so for this question, I was particularly interested on what makes a site more likely to have birds that will raise two families back to back in one summer rather than just one, because this can significantly increase the number of chicks that they produce in a year, which would be helpful to help kind of increase the numbers of the population. And so by asking this question, I'm really looking at how our decisions impact the world around us through the lens of the barn swallow. So answering this question involved many, many trips to farms like this one pictured. It was really, really wonderful field work to do despite all the manure, sometimes overly curious cows and the heights from high up on the ladder. And in large part, this was because of the really wonderful landowners who uh, welcomed myself and Becky and Katie, who are pictured here, who were my uh, field assistants. The, the landowners welcomed us onto their property, sometimes nearly every day for a couple months to check on the swallows and to kind of muck around around their animals and stuff. And so it's because of people like them who make all this knowledge possible because we wouldn't be able to access these swallows without being able to kind of come into their homes. Um, and yeah, so I know a couple of you are on this call tonight. So thank you again for just letting us go and for being so wonderful. Um, I would also like to mention that one of the reasons why this work was so wonderful was because of all of the incredible pets that we got to play with. Um, all of the dogs and lambs and horses and even cats were a pleasure to spend time with. Um, and I think in some cases we spent more time petting the dogs than we did actually checking nest, which I have no complaints about. Um, also can't go without mentioning the 
the alpacas. Um, need to give Margo a shout out for letting us bottle feed Dylan, the baby alpaca, which I think was a real highlight of our summers. Um, but anyways, getting back to the question. So when I ask what sites are the best, so what I ended up finding was that sites that have little human infrastructure will generally kind of produce more swallow young. And so that's places that don't have as many kind of buildings or parking lots or roads surrounding it. And I'm not showing the Rona here just because they kind of help build those things. Um, but this is actually the Rona in Upper Tantalan, which has barn swallows that return to it year after year, flying in and out of the open doors uh, into kind of where it sits as the lumber yard over on the left. And so all barn swallow sites where there are currently barn swallows are really important for the species. But if we're to kind of most effectively create conservation plans for the species, we really do need to prioritize which sites should kind of receive the most attention and most protection. And so if we look at a site like here where there is a massive parking lot and other stores nearby, this isn't necessarily going to be a better site well, this won't be a better site than say a more rural area that has kind of pasture and um, farm fields around. Um, so we can use this information to help kind of prioritize uh, conservation of sites and uh, figure out which kind of landowners we should engage with more. The barn swallows also need open areas like uh, pastures, wetlands, uh, meadows. These are areas where they will forage for insects and that are really important. Um, they won't necessarily forage kind of above a dense treed area, but in fact, I found that uh, there is some benefit of having trees on a site. And this is probably because we're in the Maritimes. It's often quite windy. And uh, these tree lines actually create little pockets of kind of protected space where insects will collect during bad weather. And so having some kind of structure throughout the landscape like trees can be beneficial for the swallows. So I do want to mention livestock because it's interesting. Um, I didn't find that the presence of livestock would necessarily impact whether or not birds were having these multiple families in a year. But there is a lot of research out of Europe that really highlights the importance of especially cattle um, in terms of kind of creating a better nest site. Now there's a couple reasons why I might not have found an impact in that um, sometimes, well, cattle may still be important for kind of attracting barn swallows to actually come and breed at a site, but won't necessarily have an effect after that. But also all this work done in Europe, it's in a really different landscape than we have here in the Maritimes. So for example, the UK has about 44 times the density of cattle and 1,400 times the density of sheep than we do in the Maritimes. And so they just have likely experienced like quite different pressures in terms of um, kind of selective pressures for the barn swallows in North America versus Europe. And we still don't really know um, how livestock play a role in North America or in the Maritimes. Also want you to consider metal roofs for a second. So a lot of the older style barns that swallows have typically nested in look like the ones on the left where you see these nests like pretty close up to the roof of um, where there's wood. So typically they'll either be shingles and then wood or some metal and then wood. And so what we're seeing more now is more like these barns on the right. So in these cases, there's this metal sheet that is directly exposed to the sunlight um, and has swallows nesting directly below it. And so what ends up happening here is that because the nest um, below that metal roof is only probably like five to 10 centimeters away, it can be extremely hot. Um, it would get up to upwards of 45 degrees Celsius on just like a warm sunny day in the summer. 
And so as a result, we would sometimes walk into, especially this building um, where this photo was taken and there would be chicks all over the ground kind of running around um, that were not yet ready to fly because they would have jumped out of the nest before they were ready to fly. So this is particularly an issue because if there weren't any predators around, they would just um, they would just be able to uh, the adults would continue feeding the chicks. But with lots of raccoons and cats and such, there's essentially no chance that those chicks will survive. So this is something that um, will be worthwhile to consider more in the future. I don't know if uh, there would be some way to encourage them to nest further away from the metal roof or whatnot, but this is something I think should be kind of discussed more in the future. And lastly, do you wanna bring up cats? So cats can be a bit of a controversial issue, um, but they really are a huge source of mortality for birds. Um, we do have like natural predators like raccoons at these sites. So those would, we would typically come and see the photo that's on the top right where the nest would just be completely torn down. But there were a lot of instances where we would just walk in and see the image on the bottom left of a little pile of almost fully developed feathers on the ground that would have been eaten by um, a cat. And so it is, I mean, I grew up on a lot of farms horseback riding and I know that like barn cats are everywhere, but it can be, if it's possible, like keeping cats inside, especially during kind of June when a lot of the swallows are first leaving their nest and learning to fly, that's a huge source of mortality for them. And so um, outdoor cats are definitely a huge issue. I do also want to point out this. So the underlying assumption with all this is that at these sites, there is a building to nest in. So typically somewhere where a door or a window is open from at least April to the end of September. But what happens if that building needs to be removed? Sometimes this is necessary, especially with um, kind of safety issues, if it's, cause, if it's a hazard to people around. Um, so there has been some success in building these kind of artificial nesting structures for barn swallows, where you would build it right where a building was being kind of torn down. Um, so in hopes that when the barn swallows return to that site, because they do return to the same site year after year and use often the same nest, um, that they will transfer over into this kind of artificial site. So there has been some success using these, I know back in Ontario. And so this is something to keep in mind if something needs to be changed. So all of this research is really focused on barn swallows because they're, it's important for the conservation of that species. And barn swallows do have some kind of really important stories to tell. But we can use the information that we learn from them because they're easier to study than a lot of other species and um, kind of move towards creating a healthier wor world for these animals to live in. And this will have cascading effects through uh, other animals. So if we're able to increase insect numbers, for example, that's going to help all the other aerial insectivores that depend on the same diet. Um, if we help conserve the wetlands that they need for their migration, then that's going to help shorebirds and waterfowl. And there, there will be all these cascading effects. So I just want to end the presentation by talking a bit about more broadly what you can do to help birds. So first, it can be really helpful to just be mindful about birds. So even just noticing um, when there is a bird. It's, it can be kind of a slippery slope to get into. Um, I know that I wasn't really that interested in birds until I started going for walks with one of my friends in my undergrad um, who was very interested in birds. She would just point out all the different species to me. And now I can't go walking anywhere without seeing every bird and needing to stop and look at a bird, which I'm sure many of my friends can attest to. 
But even just noticing them, you will be surprised with how quickly you can kind of become an expert on even the little things, like when you see the flock of crows flying overhead or when the like when the finch comes and makes an appearance at your bird feeder. All these can eventually lead to maybe you being able to contribute to some um, some community science endeavors. And along the same lines, I encourage you to just spend time with others outside. So if it wasn't for my friend Avery in undergrad, I probably wouldn't have really started to notice birds. You never know if the person who you're with is, if they're young, if they're going to become um, an ornithologist in the future, or if they're going to do something that um, kind of the time they spend outside sparks um, kind of inspiration for them to work to, to pay attention to conservation in the future. And I want to put in a plug here for this diversity in nature program um, that is being run through some other grad students at Dalhousie, which um, is specifically geared towards making sure that BIPOC students, so Black Indigenous people of color, are able to get the experience spending time outside with mentors who are also BIPOC um, that they might not otherwise have access to. So it's supporting programs like that, which can get people outside who might not necessarily have the chance to get outside usually, can be really useful. You can also, there are many ways to get involved in different conservation and research programs. So um, I do want to briefly mention the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, because this is a way in which um, I think it's pretty clear how uh, you can pressure government to make like really tangible changes um, on conservation. So the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is part of this, like it's an uh, agreement with Canada, US, and I think Mexico, that is like probably the fundamental kind of piece of bird conservation um, uh, legislation that is in place. It limits the well, it makes it illegal to like harm birds and their habitat and whatnot. But um, last year, Trump started to repeal a really important component of the legislation in the States that essentially makes it really easy for industry to kind of have incidental take without any, um, any pushback. And so this is something that has been put on hold with the new administration in the States, but um, I think that it's really, that's one example of how that would, that change would like have a very clear and very negative impact on birds. And so you want to kind of just pay attention to things like that. Um, you can also look to groups like Birds Canada, Nature Conservancy of Canada, Nova Scotia Nature Trust and MTRI as places that are responsible for a lot of really important um, research and also like land conservation, which can have really wide reaching benefits. And just, I'm going to for a sec focus on Birds Canada because they have some really excellent uh, programs, especially geared towards aerial insectivores that are going on. So I don't know if Ali's on the call, but she's the um, aerial insectivore coordinator for the Atlantic region. A couple of the projects that are happening this year will be Swift Watch, where you can be involved with um, kind of monitoring chimney swift roost counts. Um, you can always contribute data on monitoring uh, bird nest for Project Nest Watch. And one really interesting endeavor that's happening is that you can get signs for free for swallow friendly sites in both English and French. So those are, the sign is shown on the right where it's a kind of public display that you are swallow friendly property. If you do, um, and kind of take these steps to uh, positively impact these birds. And so if you want more information on these, there's a link at the top for Birds Canada where you can go to um, see the citizen science data. And then also Ali's contact information is at the bottom of the screen. And I'm sure she would be happy to hear more about that. And with that, I think that we can, yeah, 
we can take some questions, but also it would be interesting to hear if anyone has any other ideas for how you think that we can help birds or swallows in particular, or also if you have stories about um, barn swallows, maybe growing up or maybe where you live now, you have barn swallows that you've come back every year and stuff. And yeah, thanks for, thanks again for listening. Thank you, Hillary. It was a wonderful talk. And the chat box is lighting up with activity. So Barb says, um, she thinks swallows have learned that barns that have livestock keep their doors open and buildings without log a livestock um, tend to keep them closed. Maybe that's explaining some of the uh, results you're talking about. And she also mentions where there's livestock, there's manure, and manure and insects. Yeah, so that was particularly interesting why I didn't actually find a benefit for livestock for my research. Um, we fully expected that because there are more insects where there are livestock that um, it would have been really beneficial to have them. But it's not the first study that hasn't found an effect of them. There's some other work done in. Ontario recently that found that having livestock around didn't actually kind of change the breeding success. But I still think that, yeah, I, I think that they do play a role definitely in like having a barn swallow be at that site um, because they can be tricky to attract to a site. But I think that if you have livestock and you have kind of an open building that's appropriate, you'll probably have a pretty good chance of seeing them. Does it have anything to do, Hillary, with the types of insects they're eating? Yeah, so they they eat, they can be a bit generalist. They definitely do prefer dipterans. They that so those are just like flies. Um, but they will eat like dragonflies and um mosquitoes. They they'll kind of eat a lot of different insects. I don't know, sometimes they might, something else that someone brought up recently was that in Europe, they have different flies that live around the manure than we have here. And that might make a difference, but I, I don't really know anything more about that. Okay, and Brad mentions that if people can block off access to the nest so that barn cans can't get to them, that's also effective. Yeah, so in some spots, there will be spots, like if there are doorways where the cat would really easily be able to hide and get a swallow coming in and out, then it'd be a good place to block off. I mean, it's kind of like the best thing that you could do would have no cats there, but then there are different things that you can do to manage, like supervise them when they're outside. I think that there was also a recent study that showed that if you feed your cats more and have more playtime with them, they're less likely to actually kill um, more birds or rodents around so that they would have less harm. Okay, um, someone asks, if you need to relocate a nest out of season, uh, what is the chance of success? Yeah, I don't think that they are, and, there, there isn't really any data on that. Um, they can, I know that there have been like really mixed success with those kind of artificial nest sites. Um, a lot of the times they just won't come back, but I think there was one where they managed to get like 10 of 15 pairs nesting back in this kind of other structure that they've built beside an old barn. So I think it can be really varied. Um, and I don't think that there has been much work to really like quantify that, but it should definitely be something that receives more attention. Okay, we just have some people commenting that they like to eat honeybees, apparently. Ah, neat. Um, okay, so Trevor and Julie ask, are they threatened in many other areas outside of Canada? Or North America? Yeah. yeah, so outside of Canada, we typically, they aren't as, um, they haven't really experienced that 
many declines in kind of the southern U.S., but in a lot of other areas of the states and Canada, they have declined. If we look over to like Europe, um, the declines have been a bit uh, kind of not even across Europe, but 20 to 50 percent declines is what I've seen there. So it seems like the one the declines in the Maritimes are kind of among the greatest and almost that I've seen in the world, okay. which doesn't quite bode well for them here. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any ideas as to why barn swallows in particular have been affected so much more than other bird species like tree swallows? Yeah, so when you compare barn swallows and tree swallows, so barn swallows will um, typically migrate all the way down to where I showed in that like kind of Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, that area. Tree swallows are much shorter range migrants, so they'll only go down to kind of like the southern states, mid states even. And so there's been a lot of research showing that kind of long distance migrants do experience greater declines than shorter distance migrants. Um, maybe because of the demands that that places on kind of their bodies for that really, really long migration that they have. Um, and so that could be one reason why. Um, so Shannon asks, is there any way to outfit a building to help attract barn swallows to nest without opening the building to allow them inside? So things like make eaves bigger, install nest cups, um i mean so without opening the building i'm assuming that they would they would still be able to get in somehow um but yeah i know some people do use nest cups or ledges i know i think maggie's on this call and um she's one of the landowners who i would go to she would nail up little kind of ledges on the rafters so that the swallows had a very place to build on top of just so that their nest would be more stable um i yeah there isn't anything that's kind of like the silver bullet of if you do this the barn swallows will come um yeah i mean getting cows would be helpful <laughs> yeah i mean no no i mean i i'm on a farm with open fields all over the place and mm -hmm. i have a barn but I can't leave windows and doors open because I keep chickens and predators would get in through them. Yeah. Um, but I do see barn swallows coming to check the place out, but they never stay. And I'm trying to think what I can do to encourage them to stay and nest. Cause there's eaves, you know, just to the, you know, of the hang a foot over the barn roof. Yeah. Can you make those more attractive to them in some way to get them to stay and nest? Cause they're yeah. very high. They'd be very out of the way. Yeah, yeah. They in a lot of other places they'll go and nest under the eaves. I don't know if anyone see, has seen it very much here. Um, I've seen one instance of a nest actually being built on the side of a building, like outside of where they actually fly into the building. They do typically seem to like to actually go inside. You could try putting up an artificial um, nest. Um, Maybe I'll see if I can find a photo. Um, Brad Tom's here. Uh, they've, uh, in some barns, uh, people have built like a little just cutout in the wall. They don't need a very big one and they'll go in and out through that. Um, and I've also seen some artificial ledges just underneath eaves, but the, the aspect has to be right. Like it has to be facing the right way or they won't use it. Uh, they're kind of picky about it. Uh, I've experimented at my place a little bit with them and they'll come and investigate them. But if I, I've kind of had to move it to see where they'll like it and where they won't kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. What direction do they like, Brad? <laughs> have, they, have they told I you? Can, yeah, I haven't quite. I, the, it doesn't like the east side and it doesn't like the uh, north side facing south yet. So I'm, got, I'm going to try some more angles as time goes on. But... It didn't like either of those. Okay, not north and not east. So west or possibly south? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, no, but, but I, mean, I, I, did, just... I did cut a little hole. And I think Kedji as well has a building that they cut a hole in and they, they go in and out of that hole. Yeah, it's not that easy. It's um like there's furniture stored in the building and, and stuff like that. So it's not, we can't have them pooping inside the building. Yeah. 
Um, so letting them in is not an option, but if I can outfit something on the outside to encourage them, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Are you able to see the screen here with the wooden? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yes. Some people have made these um, and clearly with some success because there are swallows in here. You could try something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And I think that beyond maybe building kind of one of those larger structures that I showed you. Right. Uh, you, yeah, you could keep trying things and see year after year if it works. Um, that'd be great if it did because, yeah, it, yeah. They, it sounds like you have a good spot for them. So. Oh, yeah, I have tree swallows all over the place. Just I haven't yeah, been able to encourage farms to stay yet. Hmm. Okay, so Maggie asks if barn swallows build upon the same nest year after year until they're close to the roof. Um, would it be helpful to knock down the old nests before they return? Yeah. Um, I've seen some pretty tall nests, like getting about this high where they do get really tall. They they will build new ones if they want. Um, I like I would I would steer away from doing anything with it. It does, it's surprising how little room they need between the roof and the nest to actually be able to have a bunch of chicks. Um, if it's like absolutely the only spot where there would be a nest possible, then maybe, but. They must fall down on their own after a while. It's impressive how long they can stay up. Like there's one site that I go to where there's about 120 old nests around and about 15 of them are used every year. Um, mm. Some of those nests have got to be up there since uh, th like at least 15 years. Um, and they aren't actually on top of anything. They're just up on the side of a rafter. So it's quite impressive how oh, kind wow. of sturdy they can be. Okay, so that, I have the question now, what do they build these nests out of? Yeah, they they do it with mud. It's They make hundreds of trips um, where they will go to a little mud puddle, scoop up a little scoop of mud, then go and stick it on the wood and just stack that, which is why the nest can have kind of almost like a pebbly ex uh, appearance because it's each of those mouthfuls of mud. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. Okay, so Brad mentions the Migratory Bird Convention Act in Canada. Yeah, so the, it's the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in the States, but it's called the Migratory Bird Convention Act in Canada because it came from the Migratory Bird Conven Con <laughs> Convention. That's the word. Yeah, so it's an extremely important piece of legislation because that's what makes it illegal to harm or harass any migratory bird. Um, and also um, it makes it illegal to uh, destroy their nests during the breeding season, which is really important. Okay, so Anna asks, uh, do they need, oh, do they nest in dead wood structures anymore? And if so, could some areas of like conservation protection be helpful in maintaining their populations? Yeah, so barn swallows, I mean, maybe you've seen this, but there's never been any records of barn swallows actually nesting in um, kind of like dead trees. They were much more kind of in caves and um, cliff faces. So places where they can build this nest up on the side. It's more like tree swallows that will use those dead trees um, as natural nest sites and they continue to use those. But uh, it's really like there are some barn swallows in Channel Islands off of, I think like San Diego, San, Diego, San Francisco that will still nest in their natural sites, but like 99% of them will only nest in the human made structures now. Now, were they driven to human structures because of like us cutting down forests or did the barns represent kind of a better habitat for them? Yeah, so it's really interesting discussion, especially out in the Maritimes, because 
there wouldn't have been a lot of natural nest sites in the Maritimes before kind of human settlements started to expand, started to clear forests because they really need those open areas for high quality foraging sites and building these structures for them to nest in. So prior to human settlement, we really would not have had a lot of barn swallows here. Um, and that's really the case across a lot of North America where their numbers actually did increase as kind of human range expanded. Um, because suddenly there was all this nesting habitat for them. Uh, but now that we've seen these declines in the population, it's kind of like going back down to what might have been more normal before humans were really that influential on the landscape. So it's this like really complicated kind of conservation idea of like well what do we use as kind of the baseline for what we're aiming towards with conservation okay so anna asks are there any known habitat fragmentation effects on their migration patterns mm -hmm. Uh, not that I know of, uh, their migration in general is not very well studied. Um, we don't know a lot about it. Tara Imlay, before she moved out to BC, started to do some work, um, tracking where the birds actually go on their migration, but, um, there were some logistical issues with that. Plus she got a job in and finished that work. And so... Um, yeah, we don't really know. Um, yeah, I, I can't really answer that question. <laughs> there needs to be a lot more work done on that. Has anyone erected any artificial nesting structures in Nova Scotia? I don't know about Nova Scotia. Um, there was one put up on PEI last year I found an article about. And I think there's also one around... Uh, Memram Cook in New Brunswick, just over the border, but I, not in Nova Scotia that I know of. Someone else might know, but yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so Nicole asked, do they use grass with mud in the nests? Mm, not that, there's definitely the occasional piece of kind of mud or hay, or I noticed Beth's comment about the horse hail, horse tail hairs intertwine. There's definitely other stuff in the nest, but I don't think it forms like a major structural component. I, I think that it's probably more so a kind of like they go and scoop up the mud and happen to get some other stuff. Although the horse hair seems much more intentional. It's in a lot of nests. And actually last year we came across I think three separate instances where a swallow had actually gotten caught in the horsehair in the nest and like could, wasn't able to get away and ended up dying just dangling below the nest. It's quite gruesome. A bit. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've worked our way through the questions. Well, I see a question further up that Beth said, I've read that they need rough cut lumber and don't build nests on smooth lumber. So yeah, they definitely like a rougher surface. Um, it helps their nest stay up more. They'll also often, there'll be like rough metal brackets that hold some, uh, some like struts together. They'll put their nest directly on that too. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions, comments, fun stories? Okay. Well, with that, I'd like to thank Hillary. Oh, got something in the chat. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe they'll build on a lot of things, kind of any surface that sticks out, like lights, they'll go on top of doors if they're kept propped open at a particular angle for so long, wires. Some of them aren't the steadiest. I've seen nest fall before. It's not great. Oh. <laughs> oh, tangles and cobwebs. Oh, interesting. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Hillary. Um, for, thank you, Hillary. For, oh, there's some feedback. Oh, there's feedback. Yeah. oh yeah. I, I, this is Beth here. Um, I just had a comment. Um, so I, I, I had asked, um, it was kind of embedded in um, one of my comments um, about the, uh, with most of the nests in, in, in our barn, and I must admit, I say that last year we had the most um, barn swallow nests in many years. I think there was probably upwards to 40 nests uh, in the barn. It was pretty spectacular, but observing them over the years, what I find is very fascinating with the nest, and like you said, with, you know, uh, the majority being built with mud and horse hair, is the leading edge that they built on the side of the nest um, with mud as well. It's almost like a comma off to the side. And, and, and Hillary, I'd noted in um, some of your earlier photos um, that you had had that as well. Any idea, is that just, because it doesn't appear to be for stability. Um, any idea um, other, like why they have a tendency to build that feature on their nests? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I that's a really good observation and i i've never really consciously noticed that before so i mean that's great that you, you you did notice that but i i don't know um typically not a lot of work has been done to look at kind of the exact structure of their nest um maybe it helps with because when the birds come to feed the young later on, they'll kind of like perch on the edge of it and feed the chicks. So maybe it helps them perch better on the side, but yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Maggie does ask, uh, are you doing any, like what are you doing next for some bird research? Uh, that's a good question. I'm well, I'm working right now on a project out in British Columbia that actually uses a bunch of this uh, data from Nestwatch, which I mentioned. So you can go in and put observations of um, your nest, like the number of chicks that come and whatnot. And um, I'm actually in the process of compiling barn and tree swallow data going back to like the 50s, including. I think it's about 5,000 records that people have input into this. And so it's a really good example of how data that you collect could be really useful for research because that's going to help answer some really important questions about um, kind of how breeding success has changed over time. Oh, that's good to know that there's a nest structure in Kedgy by Eelweir. I'll have to look at it the next time I go. I was just thinking that. <laughs> I wonder, so it, I don't know if there was a building that swallows nested in there before, but I do feel like sometimes it could be really hard for the swallows to find them, which I think might in part be why livestock might help attract swallows to a site because that could be a really clear indication that um, that might be an appropriate breeding habitat versus something that's kind of in the forest, but I don't know. Oh, did I come to any conclusions about second nesting? Um, yeah, so they it does happen more often if there's less human infrastructure around and also actually in um, warmer areas, so we see that in the Maritimes as a whole, somewhere like up around Fredericton, where there's a lot of nests, we'll see uh, more, they're called double broods, um, than kind of the colder areas, which makes sense because the warmer it is, kind of the earlier they'll be able to start breeding, which means that the longer the breeding period will be for them to kind of raise to nest, which is really useful. Oops. Yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions. Uh, Hillary, thank you once again for a really interactive talk. Definitely had the audience going. And um, I'd also like to thank the Region of Queens for supporting us and Venture for Canada for supporting my work here at MTRI. Uh, unfortunately, we're not having a seminar next month because we will have our annual general meeting. 
but we hope to see you all again in April when Lori Finney, uh, MTRI staff member, will be talking to us about some of her work on bats in Nova Scotia. So thank you all once again for coming, and we hope you're all well. <laughs>